Watch this. A new day, a new lawsuit, this time against the Idaho Republican Party by members of the Idaho Republican Party. Specifically, though, we'll talk about the executive committee of the Bingham County Republican Central Committee. Idaho GOP chairwoman Dorothy Moon is pushed to invalidate the Central Committee's election results and propose a new date to rerun the election. But the committee says there's no need. They say that the election followed bylaws and Moon has no ground to rerun the election. Andrew Bartline read through the lawsuit and talked to a member of the committee. And Andrew, I'm curious, why is Chairwoman Moon calling this election void in the first place? Well, it's specifically about elections to fill three seats on the executive committee of Bingham County Republican Central Committee. A lot of committees there. Word salad. You get the deal. Anyway, Chairman Moon says the committee did not follow party rules. That's her first point. And the election must therefore start over. As you can imagine, Bingham County Republican Central Committee, they disagree. Chairman Moon has two complaints to directly address in this lawsuit. It includes the lack of a notice and the committee's use of a virtual meeting. She says they did it inappropriately. We'll break those down, but first we need to look at a timeline. This is going to give us some important context here. So the lawsuit says on June 15th, that the BCRCC chair, chairman at the time, Dan Cravens, announced he intended to resign. About a month later, he set an official date for his resignation that would be effective on August 1st. Precisely seven days after that announcement, BCRCC met and they had, they had to elect his replacement, I should say, and they did that. They elected Matt Thompson as their chairman, but he left two vacancies in his wake because he was wearing a lot of different hats. So the committee elected Jordan Johns to be the first vice chair and Ben Furman to be the state committeeman, which was no problem for a full month until on that 31st day, Chairwoman Moon filed a complaint. She waited until the 31st day to inform us that she thought we did it wrong. And therefore, as the state um, chairwoman, it was her obligation to come and fix it. Why didn't she reach out to us on the first day and say, hey, you did something wrong? Um, so, you know, we have our suspicions. But the bottom line is we, we're not going to get bullied around to reorganize our committee. We did everything per our rules and the state rules. And we, we would just like to move forward with the business of the county. So on September 5th, Chairwoman Moon sent a follow-up letter to BCRCC. Now, in that follow-up letter, she has a couple complaints. They're listed right there behind me. She's finding that that election was invalid. She announced that on the 11th, just a couple days later. Her complaint is about a lack of notice revolving around a 30-day period. Now, bylaws through the state and the county require an election for a replacement to be within 30 days of that vacancy. So that date would be on August 1st. And BCRCC's election happened before that vacancy date. But the bylaw does not specify if that election has to be after the vacancy takes place. They say that 30-day window, BCRCC argues, I should say, says that 30-day window could be on either side of that date specified. Additionally, Moon says they violated remote meeting rules. GOP party rules say committee members must see and hear each other on a virtual call. Well, the lawsuit admits the virtual call had technical problems and errors. However, only one voting member was on that call, and his attendance did not count because of it, and he did not get a vote because of it either. The committee appealed Chairwoman Moon's decision and is pushing back, saying they did nothing wrong and they do not want to rerun this election. What's funny, too, that people need to understand is that the Central Committee is a state created by statute organization. The Republican Party is a private organization. I am an elected official. When we have an election, you can't nullify that election. There has to be an appeals process to go through that. So, you know, Chairwoman Moon, Dorothy Moon's idea that she's going to come in on Monday and have a special meeting and simply redo the election, it, it bypasses every single rule that we have. And it does not make sense to me that she doesn't decide to say, oh, wow, let's actually follow the rules like I'm preaching that we should do. So what do the rules say they should do? Well, the GOP, they have rules about this, and 
there's an appeal process, and that's written in this letter right here that we got our hands on. They must properly determine if the election was legal or not. That's the appeal process. It's a letter from the Idaho GOP first chairman, Daniel Silver, and he made that clear yesterday through the letter, and it tells Chairwoman Moon she cannot hold another election in the meantime. And if that wasn't enough, that second paper we have up here to my side is a district judge through a temporary restraining order. That legally prevents the GOP from holding a meeting Monday to reelect these positions as well. So a hearing is now set for the end of the month, Joe, to determine the next steps forward, which this lawsuit hopes is just what would be the normal appeal process as Moon has a concern. They'll confront that concern and see if they need to solve something or not. So I'm curious, Andrew, um, why would Chair Moon, Dorothy Moon, keep pushing for a new election? Or what, I guess what would she get out of it? So the lawsuit alludes to what they perceive to be a motive. So these three positions are on the state central committee. The state central committee are the people who vote on the party platform. I, I believe they have a vote on who uh, the chairperson for the party is as well. They have a lot of say, and they come from these smaller central committees. And so if they don't exactly align with what she would want politically, again, this is what the lawsuit alludes to, uh, yeah, you would want different people in those chairs that align with you politically so you can get things done that you agree with. And uh, when I talked with uh, Ben Furman, I should say, uh, he kind of alluded to that as well, that maybe we don't agree exactly on what we want or don't want, but uh, if you can get people in those seats that align with you, you have a lot of power and control. Well, Andrew, it would appear that this story is yet another chapter in the rift within the Idaho GOP, something we'll continue to follow here on the 208. And yes, as that uh, lawsuit makes its way through the court system, this will be another interesting one to follow. So Andrew Bartline reporting here on the 208. Andrew, thank you so much. Well, we have a special look for you now at an incredible story that's unfolding around an Idaho cold case, one that happened back in 1939, a few years ago. Now, our Alexandra Duggan, she's been following this story for a while, and she has a special presentation for you tonight at 10. So here's a little bit of a story for you. This is unbelievable. Two cousins found each other on the website Ancestry.com, and it was a total accident. But now they're teaming up to look for their relative who went missing 84 years ago. Luck and circumstance present for sure. Rebecca Hartsty and Marcia Trotter discovered their great grandmother, Agnes Foltz, disappeared from Kimberly, Idaho in 1939. And her case was never investigated and there was never a missing persons report filed. Still, work goes on in the next century here to figure out what happened there. My grandmother remembered her mother. Um, she remembered waking up one morning and mommy was gone. Like, Mommy put her to bed the night before and she woke up in the morning and her mother was just gone. Her things were there, her clothes were still there. Everything was still there, but mom just wasn't there. And she remembers asking where mom was and everyone told her to stop asking. Rebecca and Marcia spent years researching what happened to Agnes and discovered that she could be buried in a potato cellar near her old home. So in July, they actually brought their research to the Kimberly Police Department, who opened an investigation into Agnes's disappearance for the very first time. And our Alexandra Duggan joins us here on the 208. And Alex, I was going through your story. I got an early look at it. It's pretty unbelievable to watch local police investing into something that happened 100 years ago, basically. I know, I think they did a really great job presenting their case to the police. I mean, they spent years researching um, what could have happened to their grandmother and the detectives took it really well. They told me that they were very appreciative of all the information that they gave them. And it's kind of unbelievable that these two women did the work of, you know, police. Yeah, I mean, when you look at documents too, going back to 1939, obviously it's not gonna be in a PDF. Um, did they talk to you about how difficult it was just piecing together the public records from 80 some years ago? Yeah, I mean, it took them years to, to do that. And mostly the, the records are missing. So you're really, you're not looking at what you have, you're looking at what isn't there. And there was a lot of pieces to their puzzle um, that they just didn't find. And so that kind of created a bigger picture where their great grandmother was missing from all these records and they, they decided, well, we need to, we need to research that more. And, and they kind of came to the conclusion that she went missing in 1939, but there was no police report ever filed. It's one of those stories where you know, you'd know you hear it in marketing, gone without a trace, no one knows what happened. And uh, Alex, it's just another great story that you're bringing us here on KTVB. And I do want to transition to another topic. This will be your final day here working with us at KTVB. Uh, we're saying goodbye today as you head up uh, to new adventures up north. And uh, I guess I just wanted to say thanks for your time here. Thanks for the investigation. And what's it been like working here uh, in the television business? I know you started in print. Um, you know what, I think it was a good challenge and I, I love everyone 
um, on this team so much. I'm going to start crying. Um, I, I love everyone so much. We all just have so much fun here. Um, and Boise is my home, and it will always be my home. But I'm just grateful um, for the community and all the support that, that you have shown me and that the 208 team has shown me and, and everyone um, on KTVB um, have been just so supportive. And I, I'm so appreciative. Well, Alex, we'll be following your work and your career for years to come. But thank you always for coming on the 208 and give us an insight. But this is not the last time you'll see Alex, of course, tonight at 10, catch her story. Uh, for now, though, we are going to step aside. But Alex, from all the viewers, from our supporters here in the newsroom, there it is. I told you to get a hearty <laughs> handshake on your sign-off. All right, the Thanks. 208 on your Friday. We'll be right back after this. Boy, live television is exciting, isn't it? Anyways, records, we seem to have broken several this summer in the weather department. We could ask Sophia Bliss all about that. But setting records is something that Twin Falls resident Miles Dashier attempted in the Snake River Canyon. He wanted to be the man with the most unassisted jumps in 24 hours. But the number to beat was 61. And Brian Holmes caught up with Miles back in 2017 to see if he could do it. That's today's 208 redial. <laughs> It's the last sunrise of spring in Twin Falls, 6 a.m. And Miles Dasher is in the middle of his 54th jump from the Perrine Bridge. That's him under the white canopy. It's a quest that began 19 hours earlier as Miles is working his way to an unofficial base jumping record yeah. for most human powered jumps in 24 hours. It's weird to think of him doing it all night long. Three. Two, one. But that's exactly 55. What he's done. Yeah. Catherine Reese came all the way from Kimberly just to watch. I'm proud of him. I think it's an awesome job to do. But it isn't <laughs> an easy one. Oh god. I mean the jumps. The, you can do the jumps, but the climb is is what's amazing. I'm gonna keep hiking. Miles has to make a 486 foot climb sure. out of the yeah, Snake yeah. River Canyon. Oh yeah. After every jump. I kind of like it though. It's kind of my favorite part. Not sure if you can sense the sarcasm, but by the time Miles reaches 60 jumps uh, and the subsequent climbs, I'm all noodly right now. He will have hiked enough to summit Mount Everest from sea level, yeah. a height of more than 30,000 feet. He's going to be pretty sore in the next few days. Back at the top. It's back to the middle of the bridge by bike. <laughs> where a group awaits. This is 56, huh? It sure is. To get uh, miles ready for the next plunge from the Perrine. The record right now is 61 jumps, set last fall right here. Oh, Lordy. By Danny Wayland from Denver. <sighs> and Miles, <sighs> who moved to twin nine years ago, wants to bring that record back home. Yeah, Miles. Meanwhile, below the bridge is Zach Carbo, Literally one of many who will help Miles make his goal. Energizer. Like he's who they base the Energizer bunny off of. See ya. Yeah. 
Miles has made this jump more than 3,000 times. All right, let's see if we can get a bullseye, huh? Since 1999. Right, follow me down. Here we go. This way. He once had the record of 57 jumps at the age of 35. Now, we gotta let her fly here. He is 12 years older. Oh, maybe a little. And on pace to take possession again. Yeah. Well, now we're standing in the bullseye. Do you know what number he's on? Let's see ya. A few more leaps, a few more landings. Yeah! I'm tied. A few more climbs. Need to beat it. And Miles is ready to Are reclaim the record. Yes. Let's go, Miles! With his wife, Nikki, waiting for the final flourish. At 9.30 a.m., with an hour and a half to spare, Miles Dasher has done it. 62 jumps yeah! in 24 hours. Nice job, honey! Wait, you're supposed to hug me first. Nice job, buddy. Yeah, Not that he's stopping there. Oh my gosh, you got an hour and a half. Make it happen. Let's keep going, huh? Let's keep going. Brian Holmes, Idaho's News Channel 7. So, Dasher's record of 62 jumps in 24 hours it only lasted for 90 days, three months. Danny Wheeland, the previous record holder, jumped 64 times in 24 hours from the same spot in September 2017. And according to the Guinness World Records books, the current world record holder is Nicole Senecal, who jumped it and ascended 37 times. I know jumped it is not a real word. They jumped and ascended 37 times on the Perrine Bridge in Twin Falls on October 23, 2020. So tonight, though, at 7 o'clock, a new challenger is entering the field. Jonathan Cox is going to attempt the world record for the most base jumps in 24 hours by human powered ascent. He plans to go continuously until 7 p.m. tomorrow. So there's his 24 hour window. He's also raising funds that will be donated to the Twin Falls County Search and Rescue Team. And we're going to check in with Jonathan hopefully on Monday. We want to see if he sets the record. Plus, everyone loves all the memories and the views and everything out there on the Prine Bridge. All right, 208 returns right after this.
Our view across southern Idaho is starting to change. We, uh, from this view from Sun Valley, you can see it's looking a lot more like late summer rather than the peak of summer because we've got some color starting to change in the trees. And if you're like me, you might be a little bit torn towards enjoying the warm temperatures while they last and looking fall forward to the fall colors as they start to make their way into the area. So here is the recipe, the weather recipe, if you will, for some ideal fall colors. We would need a warm, wet spring, which we kind of got a little bit this spring, the wet side, not necessarily the warm side. We were a little on the cool side. Favorable summer weather. So if you take that as average summer conditions, we saw at above average temperatures and above average moisture. So let's just say chalk that up to 50% for favorable summer weather. Warm, sunny fall days. We haven't quite started the official start of fall yet, but certainly we're staying warm and sunny and cool fall nights. A little bit of the same theme there where it's not quite fall yet, but we are still seeing some cool nights. And also there are a few other weather conditions that can delay the onset of those fall colors a late spring, both and severe summer drought. I would say spring was a little bit more to on time this year, and we definitely didn't have a summer drought because we saw a lot of wet conditions. Also, the intensity of the colors can depend on the weather because a warm period during the fall without the cool nights will lower the intensity of the colors. So all in all, I think we're shaping up to some pretty great fall colors across the state. You could see that those temperatures again are on the warm side, favoring a little bit more towards summer, and in the mountains we're in the low 70s and Magic Valley spots in towards the lower 80s. And this could could be the last summer that we see these very warm summer like temperatures. We've got this high pressure center that will be staying over our region until Monday. Then Tuesday we start to see some changes start to work their way in and that means some cooler air will be making its way south and that means that by Wednesday we're talking about highs in the 60s for some valley spots. Highs in the 60s, not low. So now looking back at our our weekend forecast doesn't don't those 90s look really nice and comfortable in comparison to the 60s that we'll see? So really soak them in if you can this weekend. Really nice and warm conditions. And even for the mountains, that cool down means that we could be talking about high elevation snow as we go into next weekend. So also a good weekend last, last weekend for some of the warmer camping conditions. So as we go towards the week, we're going to see some big changes. We'll be going from the 70s, a higher end of the 70s on Tuesday. And then Friday, we're talking about the higher end of the 60s. So Joe, a little bit of a roller coaster for the temperatures, but it's a really great opportunity for us to seize the warmer conditions while we have them. I got to say, I'm on the same page as you, where yeah. like I'm really enjoying this nice weather where you go yes. outside and don't feel like you're going to melt. But I'm looking forward to uh, the colder temperatures because I've been driving to work every morning with the windows down. You get a little bit of that fall chill. Yes, I love it. A little bit of crisp feeling outside. I, I can't get enough of that. I will say, Sophia, it's great weather for golfing. We know that. It All is, right. Definitely. Sophia Bliss here on the 208. We'll talk to you soon. Well, I want to tell you this really interesting episode of Viewpoint coming up Sunday at 9 a.m. only here on Channel 7. And I hope you're ready to learn a lot because my conversation this week is one of the top leaders in Idaho, maybe a leader you don't know a lot about, State Controller Brandon Wolf. Yes, we will cover exactly what the State Controller does. Controller Wolf highlights the differences between his office and the Treasurer. Common question, but within the Controller's office, there's a growing program, Transparent Idaho. He's been working on it for 10 years. You're looking at it. It's a collection of tools that promote government transparency on things like spending and allocation of resources. Well, Controller Wolf tells us how his effort is focused locally, too. I always wanted to have some place we could have one portal to look up information. We have 44 counties, 199 cities, 193 school districts, 800 plus taxing districts. That's over 1,200 websites to go to try to compare and contrast. And like you said, with property tax, as an example, when you try to look up and say, compare Ada County to Canyon County to Kootenai County or Bonneville, we needed something instead of one place to go to. And so it was being able to standardize the data. So it was standard of however Ada County clerk reported it versus another that we made it standard and uniform. Then we can compare apples to apples. And so that was the genesis. We put on local government. We started with the counties first. We're working with the cities, the school districts, and then the, the taxing districts. But again, and then you can change it to a percentage and you say, well, how much is a county spending on their jail, their sheriff and prosecuting attorney versus another one? And not meant to be a gotcha to say, hey, they did something or find out something bad, but what are the best practices? If I'm a county commissioner and I can look on here and say, oh, we're spending 40% of our budget on public safety and this county's only spending 22, what are they doing? 
And our conversation was a fun one. You'll get to learn about Wolf's Path to Controller, which is a great story in itself. And also, I'll give you this. We also talk about Napoleon Dynamite. Yes, the movie. You'll have to tune in to find out. Sunday, 9 a.m. We'll see you there. All right, we'll take your comments after this break. Keep sending them. All right, big weekend ahead. One thing keeping us from getting to the weekend, your comments, so let's get through these. Larry says, leave it to the GOP to continue electing folks like Moon who don't know the rules and what the rest of us to follow without question. Hashtag the 208, one opinion there from Larry. This person says, this is Dale in Boise, can't help but wonder who kept repacking his shoots for the base jump record. That's a really good question and something that I'm actually going to look into, hopefully before we uh, report on the update on Monday, Dale. That is a really good question. The silent heroes, those count too. Uh, this person says, so sorry to see that Alexandra Duggan is leaving KTVB. Her investigative reports were excellent, thoughtful, and thorough. Yes, Alex uh, here on the 208 and across Channel 7 done some great work. And this person wants to know, where is Alex going? She is actually going up to Spokane, Washington. She'll be working for the Spokesman Review, the uh, paper up there. So we'll keep an eye on her. Happy trails, Alex. Catch your story tonight at 10 p.m. The rest of you, you have a great weekend. And don't forget, take care of each other. Go Broncos. Go down. Denver Broncos and go Colorado Buffaloes. All right, we coming.